Hi guys, so today we're going to be talking about some barriers to LGBT patients accessing OBS and gynae services. So what we're going to be covering today is mostly about cervical cancer screening. We'll be covering a little bit of sexual health, pregnancy and women's health. Um, but we will be doing another session on sexual health in the future. And we do have a session that we've already recorded on um, IVF and family planning which covers quite a lot of pregnancy as well. The key take home message from today is that um, everyone's experience is unique. So barriers that exist for some LGBT patients may not be applicable for others. And that these barriers can be particularly complicated by intersection, intersectional identities. So if your patient has a disability as well as being LGBTQ+, that can add an additional barrier. So to start with then, we're going to talk about cervical cancer screening. So this is offered to everyone with a cervix between the ages of 25 and 64. In the UK, it's every three years between 25 and 50, and then every five years from 50 to 64. It's a screening test for the HPV virus, which causes more than 90% of cervical cancers. Reminders to attend this screening are automatically sent to all cis women. So... What about trans men and non-binary people with a cervix? These patients have to register with their GP to receive invites or every three years remember themselves to book for the screening. This brings us on to some of the barriers to LGBT patients accessing cervical cancer screening. Having to request the test yourself makes a patient less likely to do it. We all live busy lives and we often forget for example, I often forget to book to go to the dentist and having to remember to book a test yourself makes a patient less likely to go for that test. Additionally, um, trans, and, trans men and non-binary patients having to ask the GP to be invited to such screening can be quite a daunting experience, especially if they've experienced discrimination from healthcare professionals in the past. And it also relies on the patient knowing that they need to request it, because if they're not aware that they need to request it, then they're not going to do it. And lastly, if you have to request a test for something yourself, it can diminish the importance of having this test done. Another barrier to LGBT patients accessing cervical cancer screening is that often, unfortunately, there's a massive lack of education in the NHS and in the public school system about LGBT health needs. And that's kind of why we're doing talks like this one. Um, so such normative sex education in schools is often inadequate, let alone for diverse sexual experiences. For example, how many of you had your HPV vaccine without really knowing what it was for? Lack of education can provide a massive barrier to accessing cervical cancer screening because if you don't know why you're doing it, you're less likely to do it. Additionally, LGBT, LGBT people are more likely than the general population to be victims of sexual violence and assault. Therefore, intimate examinations such as the one required for cervical screening are not often attended. And therefore, for your LGBT patients, you need to be able to explain their importance even more. Additionally, testosterone therapy can cause vaginal dryness and atrophy, which can make a speculum examination particularly uncomfortable. That makes it less likely that patients who are on testosterone therapy will feel comfortable attending cervical cancer screening. Some of the advice to overcome this is to offer extra lubrication or use a smaller speculum, or both. Other advice includes using topical oestrogen, as this can help with vaginal dryness, but obviously some trans patients may not be comfortable with this, and it's, it really requires you to have a proper conversation with your patients about what is and what is not acceptable to them. Lastly, um, an examination of the genitals is particularly likely to trigger feelings of dysphoria in trans and non-binary patients. This won't be the case for all patients, but it's particularly important to be aware of. Ways that you can overcome this is to offer a larger covering, uh, a bigger blanket, or to enable the patient to use a phone or a tablet with headphones. The important thing here is to communicate with your patient, use terminology to describe their pelvic region that they are comfortable with, and go slowly and just explain why it is that you need to be doing the screening. 
these services are often offered in women's spaces and might even have names like women's health clinics or women's centres. And entering these places can be very daunting for LGBT patients for many reasons, like having to explain why they are there or being worried that other patients in the waiting room are wondering why they are there. There are clinics that are available specifically for gender diverse patients and it might be useful to know those in your local area to be able to point your patients towards them if they are finding that this is a significant barrier for them attending. Asexual patients are at a reduced risk of cervical cancer. If they've never been sexually active, they're less likely to have contracted HPV. But it's important to assume that your ase- important not to assume that your asexual patient has never had sex. It's very important to have an open conversation about them with their risk if they have chosen not to attend. Uh, lesbian and bisexual patients or patients, who, with, patients with a vagina who have sex with other people with a vagina need to be aware that HPV can still be transmitted through intercourse, uh, through skin-to-skin contact and through use of sex toys. This information is not typically taught in schools, it's not typically well understood by these patients. So many of those patients may feel that they don't need to attend, but it's again important to have an open conversation with them about their risk of HPV and try to encourage them to attend if you can. Obviously, as with everything, it is patient choice whether they choose to attend. And lastly, intersectionality can play a massive role in whether patients attend cervical cancer screening. Um, For example, many of these centres and sexual health clinics are not accessible to patients with physical disabilities and even simple things like getting your legs into stirrups or taking uh, flights of stairs might be difficult for patients with physical disabilities or situations like this may be um, difficult for patients with uh, neurodivergence. So again, it's just important to view your patient holistically and communicate with them about how you can make this service more accessible for them. A lot of the barriers that I've already discussed to accessing cervical screening applies to sexual health as well. And we are planning to do a proper talk on LGBT sexual health at some point. A lot of the key takeaway message with sexual health and LGBT patients is that they are not aware of their risks. And as I've touched upon already, this can be because education in schools is lacking. Another important thing is that patients sort of have an expectation that doctors don't know about their identity, and don't understand the sort of sex that they're engaging in. And I think being able to sort of prove your patients wrong can help establish good rapport. So you do need to make sure that you're understanding the terminology that the patient's using to describe themselves. Um, It's kind of not an excuse to not help your patients just because you don't understand the behaviour or sexual behaviour they might be engaging in. Basically, don't assume that just because your patient is trans or disabled or straight or gay that they are not or that they are sexually active. So a good way to make sure that you're being inclusive with your language for a sexual history is asking things like, are you currently sexually active? Do you have a current sexual partner? And it's important to specifically ask about a sexual partner because a lot of asexual patients may have a partner, um, but they may not be sexually active with that partner. So specify that you need a sexual partner. Do you use barrier protection during intercourse? And is there any chance that you could be pregnant? With this question, be careful not to make yourself look like an idiot. Everyone's transition can be different, um, so some patients may still have their uterus, others may not. Lastly, LGBT patients are more likely to engage in risky sexual behaviour and general health behaviours than the general population. Uh, For example, they're more likely to be smokers. This increases um, risks of STIs, unplanned pregnancies, and obstetric slash gynecological complications. It's important to be aware of, but it shouldn't contribute to any stigma towards these patients. In many cases, this risky behaviour is due to lack of education, uh, being estranged from families, and other factors that are out of the patient's control. So it is important to just be aware that these patients are at high risk of certain things, but you shouldn't use that to formulate 
definitely your diagnosis. The last thing I want to talk about with barriers to patients accessing ops and gynae services is to do with this idea of um, history taking and inappropriate curiosity from healthcare professionals. A study that was done showed that 24% of patients felt that they had to teach the healthcare provider about themselves in order to get appropriate care, and 15% found that they were asked unnecessarily invasive questions about their identity that were not related to the reason for their visit. And this is called diagnostic overshadowing. Now, anatomy can be important for formulating differential diagnosis. For example, you need to know if a patient still has their uterus in order to formulate diagnoses that might relate to that. But don't start asking questions that are not relevant, just out of curiosity. Because, for example, let's say you've never met a trans person before, you can't just start asking questions just because you're curious. That will make your patient feel uncomfortable. Um, and it, but if you must ask, you must ask it sensitively. And you may, if appropriate, feel the need to clarify why specifically you need to know the answer to that question. Everyone's journey is different. Some trans people can still get pregnant. Some can't. Some can still get others pregnant. And some can't. It's important not to assume. And just to be aware of the different risks that your different patients have. And as we will touch on in our IVF session, pregnancy is a unique experience for all pregnant people, but can be especially for trans people. Typically, pregnancy services are aimed at women, and it's important to remember that not all pregnant people will be women. So make sure you're asking your patient how they wish to be preferred, sorry, how they wish to be referred, i.e., whether they want to be called a parent, a birthing person, or another term, as well as how their partner wishes to be referred to and how the partner wishes to be involved. For example, people taking testosterone usually stop having their periods around two to six months after starting, but it is still possible for these patients to get pregnant. So you wouldn't want to assume that just because your patient is or isn't on testosterone there, that something like an ectopic pregnancy isn't a cause for their abdominal pain. Thank you so much for listening. This was a very brief overview of some of the barriers that patients might face when accessing OBS and gynae services. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to message us. Our Instagram is at LGBTHeath. Um, and yeah, we will be uploading some more talks soon, so thank you for listening.